If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. And I'll be reading this chapter from verse 1. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10 and from verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days." For the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. Well, may God speak to us in his word this morning. But let's just turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we do come to praise and worship you As our God, the one true and living God, the creator of heaven and earth, we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three and three in one. We know that there is no God like you. There is none who can be compared with you. You are great and greatly to be praised. We worship you as our creator. We praise you as the God who has made the sun, the moon, and the stars, this world, and everything in it. And the very air that we breathe comes from you. We know that you are the God who causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall. Uh, We know that you provide for us food day by day. You are also intimately acquainted with all our ways. You know when we lie down and when we rise up. You know the very thoughts that we think. 
and how we praise you for this intimate knowledge you have of us, and not just as your creatures, but as your children. We thank you that you have redeemed us through the precious blood of your Son. Thank you that you were willing to send your beloved Son into this world to bear our sin, defiled and ugly as it is, upon himself on that cross at Calvary. And we thank you that he satisfied the full wrath of God because of our sin. Thank you that he made peace for us. Thank you that through him we are reconciled to you. Thank you that we have been set free from slavery to sin. That we can sing in the words of that hymn that there is no condemnation to us. That we are now alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are yours and you are ours. And we just rejoice in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and our salvation. And we pray and ask that these precious truths of the gospel would would move us, would enable us to live day by day for the glory and honor of your name, that we would be those who who yield ourselves to you each and every day to walk in, in holiness and in fear of the Lord. We pray that you would forgive us for our sins and our trespasses. We acknowledge this morning that we, we do sin in word, deed, and thought. There are sins that we commit that we are not even aware of. We are ignorant of certain sins. And where we have grieved you in any way, we pray that you would forgive us for these sins, that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that you would wash us in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. And how we pray that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would bear the fruit of the Spirit in our life, that we would know greater love, greater joy, greater peace, kindness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, uh, self-control, uh, patience, that we would be given grace to, to forgive one another where we may have offended each other. But we do pray for more of the work of your Holy Spirit within our lives and hearts and that we would be yielding to you and to your word day by day. We do want to thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it is perfect and pure and holy. We thank you that through your word you revive our hearts and you refresh our souls. And we pray even this morning and throughout the day as the word will be preached by your servants that you will empower them and equip them and that the word would come to us with, uh, with authority from heaven itself and that you would speak to us and change us and conform us ever more to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do want to pray and ask that we would also know your grace as we fellowship together, as we have conversation, that even the very words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And so we do want to commit all these things to you in prayer and this day. Watch over us and keep us. Uh, Enable us to bring you great glory and honor in all we do and say. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. I want to begin uh, very quickly with uh, a plug for a book uh, that I found in uh, Mike's store at Christ Church. uh, And it's on the second hand. Well, it's in my hand, actually, at the moment. So it... (laughs) It probably won't make it to the second-hand table in the dining room. Uh, There is only one copy, so we may have to have an auction uh, and (laughs) sell it to the highest bidder. Uh, But I think it is still in print. Uh, It's it's published by Banner of Truth, and uh, as far as I know, it is still available, but not at this amazing price of 25 rand. Uh, this, uh, we're thinking this morning uh, and this afternoon about angels and demons. And there is a lot of stuff that has been written on the subject of angels and demons, but hardly any of it is worth reading. Uh, there is very, very little that has been written from a Reformed and evangelical perspective. But this book, Satan Cast Out uh, by Frederick Leakey, is one of the very rare exceptions. So if you're looking for a book about demonology, uh, the the subject of what the Bible has to say about uh, the demonic and the devil, then this is the best book that you can find in the world. Now, I realize that I'm biased because Professor Leakey 
uh, was a Reformed Presbyterian minister in Northern Ireland. He was one of my colleagues. Uh, He was the principal of the college where I trained. He taught systematic theology there. Uh, He was a very dear friend. Uh, But even in spite of all of that, this is still the best book on the subject that you can buy. Uh, It was written uh, really for our church when we were involved in mission work in Ethiopia in the 1970s. And Professor Leakey was asked to study uh, the subject of demonic possession and so on, uh, and to write a paper on it for our missionaries in Ethiopia who were encountering demonic possession. And so he went and he did uh, further study. He he did a a master's uh, of theology, uh, and then he wrote this book uh, as well. So it really is worth having. Uh, He says himself in his introduction, uh, talking about how little has been written on it, he says there has been a steady trickle of dispensationalist writing on the subject, and in recent years a number of books by evangelical writers have appeared. He says they are mostly superficial in their treatment of the subject. Some of them contain wild and unwarranted statements And a few of them are positively dangerous for the unwary to read. So uh, this is a safe guide to the subject. Now I'm going to give it to Mike afterwards. Please, it's not Ultimate Frisbee. Uh, Don't jump on him. Uh, Just try and try and work out in a Christian way who's going to get this book. Okay, so Satan Cast Out by Frederick Leakey. Well, please turn now to uh, the book of Daniel again and to the 10th chapter, which Jonathan read for us. We're thinking today, uh, this morning and this afternoon, about spiritual warfare. And uh, the title that I gave, because I wasn't quite sure how I was going to arrange the material, was Spiritual Warfare Part 1 and Spiritual Warfare Part 2. Uh, not the most imaginative of titles. So if you want a better title for this morning's message, it is Know Your Enemy. Spiritual Warfare, Know Your Enemy. The art of war is a Chinese military treatise which was written by Sun Tzu in the 6th century BC. It's actually older then than the book of Daniel. It's one of the oldest and most successful books ever written on military strategy. And one of the most famous maxims in that book, which you may well have heard, is this. If you know your enemies and know yourself, you can win a hundred battles without a single loss. So that's the advice of Sun Tzu. You need to know your enemy. If you don't know your enemy, then you won't know who to fight or how to fight them. And that's what I want us to think about together this morning. I want us to think about who our enemy is in spiritual warfare so that we will know how to fight that enemy. We need to set the scene, first of all, here in Daniel 10. This vision, we're told in verse 1, was given to Daniel in the third year of the reign of King Cyrus. Cyrus was the first of the Persian emperors. Babylon, the head of gold, uh, the empire of Nebuchadnezzar, has now passed away, just as Daniel prophesied in chapter 2 and has been replaced with the next kingdom, uh, the the silver kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, uh, the two-horned ram uh, of Daniel chapter 8. So this is now the third year of King Cyrus when Daniel is given this vision. In the first year of King Cyrus, the exile in Babylon came to an end. 
Jeremiah had prophesied that the exile would last for 70 years. Isaiah had prophesied 200 years before that God would raise up his servant, a man named in Isaiah as Cyrus. Again, we were thinking yesterday about how amazing and how accurate these prophecies are in the Bible. Well, Isaiah names Cyrus as the one who 200 years later will allow the Jews to return from exile. And this is the Cyrus that Isaiah named and spoke about 200 years before. Uh, The exile has come to an end. The 70 years have expired and the Jews have been allowed to go home to Jerusalem and to rebuild their ruined temple. That was in the first year of Cyrus. But in the third year, they seem to have hit an insuperable obstacle. Please turn, uh, if you want to uh, follow along, to the book of Ezra and chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. You'll find Ezra after First and Second Chronicles. Uh, Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, uh, because here we have a description of what was happening in the third year of Cyrus back in Jerusalem. Ezra 4 and verse 4, Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. These are the ones who have come back from exile, the people of Judah. The people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So that's what's happening at this moment back in Jerusalem. The people of the land, uh, that is the Samaritans and other peoples around Judah, they have conspired together and have sent all kinds of false reports to the Persians about what the Jews are doing now that they have gone back to Jerusalem. They are slandering the Jews. The history books tell us that Cyrus was away on campaign in his third year, and his son Cambyses stood in for him. He acted as regent. He guarded the throne while his father Cyrus was away on campaign. And perhaps that explains why a decree from the king of Persia brings the work of rebuilding in Jerusalem grinding to a halt. So that is what's happening away back home in Jerusalem, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from Daniel. The work has ground to a halt. And Daniel hears about this opposition from the Samaritans. He hears about this decision of the king to force the work of rebuilding to stop in Jerusalem. And he responds to that by fasting and praying for three weeks solid. Think about that. Even though he's now an old man, a very old man in his 80s, and even though this concerns a situation that is hundreds of miles away, he is deeply concerned about it, and he fasts and he prays earnestly. Verse 2, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies. No meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. He prays earnestly and fervently about this situation, this crisis back in Jerusalem. Daniel is a terrific example of a prayer warrior. And Daniel 10 is tremendously enlightening for us because it shows us 
what happens in the spiritual realm when Daniel prayed. And it shows us what happens in the spiritual realm when you and I pray. After three weeks of earnest prayer, Daniel gets an answer. A heavenly visitor appears to him while he's standing beside the Tigris River. He's described in verses 5 and 6 in the most awesome terms. This being is dazzlingly, radiantly glorious. And Daniel strains at the limits of language and vocabulary as he tries to describe this glorious figure. He ransacks the vocabulary of precious metals and precious stones and natural elements. Everything about this figure expresses his power and his beauty and his majesty and his glory. The question is, who is this figure? Well, we're not told his identity. Is it an angel that's appearing here to Daniel? After all, it was the angel Gabriel who brought Daniel the visions of chapter 8 and chapter 9. Uh, just look back to chapter 8 for a moment at verse 17. Because we have here uh, Daniel's reaction to Gabriel appearing before him. The voice comes in verse 16 from heaven. Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So Gabriel came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. That's how Daniel reacts to the appearance of the angel Gabriel in chapter 8. But his reaction to this figure in chapter 10 is much, much more violent. In fact, a large part of chapter 10 is taken up with describing just how overwhelmed Daniel was by what he saw and what he experienced. And the description of this figure goes beyond anything that is said in the rest of the book of Daniel about angels. And of course, this ties in very well, doesn't it, with what Ronald has been teaching us from Revelation 1, 2, and 3, because this description of this heavenly figure is very, very similar to the description of the Lord Jesus in Revelation 1. It's very similar to other Old Testament descriptions of God. So it seems to me, although not all commentators agree on this, but it certainly seems to me that this is most likely the Son of God, uh, the same figure that I think was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. Now, some commentators, for different reasons, are reluctant to say that this is the Son of God. They prefer to say that this is an angel, uh, and I'm not persuaded uh, by their reasons why it can't be the Son of God, and I'm not persuaded that making it an angel really gets around some of the problems. This is not something that I would want to go to the stake for, uh, but for what it's worth, uh, I think that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. Well, why has he come? Well, we're not left to guess, are we? We're told explicitly in verse 12. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. It's in answer to Daniel's prayer about the situation back in Jerusalem. So Daniel 
prays about this crisis in Jerusalem, and by his prayers, he unleashes awesome spiritual forces. The Son of God himself leaves heaven and comes to earth to fight in answer to Daniel's prayer. So, we've set the scene. Now, I want us to look together at two things this morning. First of all, the enemy, and then the strategy. The enemy, first of all. We're given a little bit more information about what happened as a result of Daniel's prayer. Daniel has been told that his prayers were heard in heaven immediately. As soon as he began to pray three weeks ago, his prayers were heard immediately. Verse 12. But there has been a three-week delay between him beginning to pray and the arrival of this heavenly visitor. Isn't that interesting? Now, why is that? Why the three-week delay? Is it because it's a three-week journey from heaven to earth? Well, obviously not. Uh, And you know that even without having to look at chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. Because here we have Daniel in chapter 9 praying, one of the famous prayers of confession of the Bible. And it says in verse 20, While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. And Gabriel says in verse 23, At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. So in chapter 9, Daniel prays, and while he's praying, the, the words have no sooner left his mouth than immediately Gabriel zips down from heaven to earth to bring the vision at the end of chapter 9 in response to his prayers. So it's possible to get from heaven to earth in an instant. Gabriel's able to do it, so surely the Son of God can do it as well. So why the delay here? Why the three-week delay? Why does the Son of God not come immediately here as soon as Daniel begins to pray? And the answer to that question is given in verse 13. Because the Lord says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So there's the reason for this 21-day delay. It's because the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood the Lord. So who is this prince of Persia? Cyrus was the king of Persia. One of the kings of Persia described at the end of verse 13. So who is the prince of Persia? Well, the clue to answering that question is in verse 13 and verse 21, where we're told that the angel Michael is the prince of Judah. He's described as the prince of Judah, the angel Michael. In other words, the prince of Persia is not a man. It's not a person but a spirit. Behind evil rulers are evil spiritual beings. They are the real power behind the throne. They're called princes because they have power and authority. 
And this is something that we see in the New Testament as well. Ephesians 6 verse 12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The devil is the god of this age. Isaiah 24, 21, In that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. So there are powers in the heavens, in the spiritual realm, in the invisible realm, as well as kings on the earth below. There are princes and principalities and powers. And that's what the prince of Persia is. And it seems from this chapter that different demonic beings, different demons, have jurisdiction and influence over particular geographical places. So there is the prince of Persia in verse 13. There is the prince of Greece in verse 20. And then, as we've seen, there is the prince of Judah, the angel Michael. So, hopefully you can see the sequence of events clearly here. Daniel hears that the Samaritans have convinced the king of Persia to pass a decree stopping the building of the temple in Jerusalem. So, Daniel then prays for three weeks that God would change the heart of the Persian king and allow the work to continue. As soon as Daniel starts praying, that very moment, just as in chapter 9, the Son of God immediately leaves heaven and goes to change the heart of the king of Persia. He goes to answer Daniel's prayer. But changing the heart of the king of Persia takes three weeks because he is resisted by the prince of Persia, this demon who has influence and power over the Persian Empire. The angel Michael comes and helps, and eventually the Son of God triumphs. Now, I'm pretty sure that there are a few questions rising in your mind at this point. Uh, I hope that there are some questions rising in your mind at this point. How can the Son of God be resisted for 21 days? Well, you'll have to make sure you're here at 4 o'clock to get the answer to that question. (laughs) That's not to make sure that you come back from the beach or from wherever. That's just the way that the material has come together. (laughs) Daniel 10 is drawing back the veil and showing us a glimpse of the invisible warfare that's going on all the time in the spiritual realm. It shows us who the real enemy is. And the real enemy of the people of God is not the Samaritans back in Judah who are opposing the rebuilding of the temple. The real enemy is not the Persian king who listened to them. The real enemies are spiritual. There are evil spirits blinding the Samaritans and the Persians and stirring them up to hatred and jealousy. Again, Ephesians 6 verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against human beings. Our real enemies are not human beings but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's our enemy. Now, that doesn't mean that the Samaritans and the Persians are innocent. It just shows us who the real enemy, the ultimate enemy is. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched the television series 24, 
Uh, it's quite a popular one uh, back in the UK, and uh, my wife and I uh, enjoyed watching all the different seasons of it. It's basically the same plot every time. It's the same people, uh, but the, the, the terrorist threat is different uh, in each case. Uh, it's, it's all about, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, a man called Jack Barr, and he is a special agent in the Los Angeles counter-terrorist unit. And each series involves him uh, tracking down people who are plotting a terrorist act. And it takes place in real time over the course of 24 hours. Uh, But when he tracks down the people responsible and stops them, he just discovers that actually they're being manipulated by someone else (coughs) higher up. And so he goes after them and he tracks them down and captures them, but then uh, it turns out that there's someone else again higher up uh, pulling the strings. Uh, And uh, and for about the first 18 hours, he realizes uh, that he's been wasting his energy fighting against the pawns of the great uh, puppet master. And it takes 24 hours for him to peel back the layers and get to the real enemy. And that's a little bit like what's going on here in Daniel 10. The Samaritans and the Persians are causing problems for the Jews. They are enemies to the Jewish people and to the cause of righteousness. But they're only the pawns of far more evil and far more powerful enemies. Enemies who are not human, but spiritual. While the Jews were exiles in Babylon for those 70 years, back home in Judah, the Samaritans and the other neighboring peoples had the run of the land. They could do what they want with it. They had all these towns and villages and fields and farms. Suddenly it was all theirs. But now the Jews have come back and they're reclaiming what was theirs. And the Samaritans are resentful and they're jealous That's already happening. But then these satanic spirits play on those evil feelings and aggravate them and stir them up and incite the Samaritans to send these slanderous messages to the Persian government. You need to stop these Jews because once they get their temple rebuilt and once they get their city rebuilt, they're going to revolt and you won't be getting any taxes from these people again. And the Persian king, Cambyses, who's standing in for his father, he's already insecure. He's already suspicious. He's already predisposed to listen to that kind of slander. But then the demonic prince of Persia is whispering poison in his ear and aggravating and stirring up and amplifying his paranoia. I know that we have at least a few Lord of the Rings fans. Uh, So perhaps for their benefit, uh, this prince of Persia is like the loathsome counselor of King Theoden, Grima Wormtongue in Lord of the Rings. And if you've seen the film or read the books, you know that Grima Wormtongue uh, lurks beside the throne of King Theoden, a good man. Uh, Theoden is a good king, but he's under the power of this loathsome counselor, Grima Wormtongue, and he pours his poison into the king's ear, and he controls the king's decisions by his words. And actually, and this is a spoiler alert if you haven't seen the film or read the book, (laughs) so close your ears now, but behind Wormtongue is actually uh, the evil wizard Saruman, We think that he's good, turns out that he's bad. And it's only when Gandalf breaks Saruman's power that the spell that's over the king himself is broken. That's the kind of thing that's going on here. Uh, The Persian king is already disposed to, to believe what the Samaritans are saying, but he's being influenced. His paranoia is being played upon by this demonic prince of Persia. Well, that's all very interesting, isn't it? But what has that to do with us? Samaritans and Persians and kings and princes. 
It has everything to do with us. This could not be more practical or more important for us because it tells us that our real enemies ultimately are not persecuting governments. Our enemies are not the militant LGBTQI plus lobby. Our real enemies are not those intolerant atheists and antagonistic teachers and mocking workmates and classmates. They're not your enemy. Behind all of these are spiritual enemies that are inspiring and provoking and aggravating and stirring up human enemies against the kingdom of God. We see exactly the same thing happening today that is going on here in Daniel 10. These unbelievers that we deal with every day, they already feel contempt for believers. They already feel convicted by your words and by your lifestyle. They're already enemies of God. But there is a spiritual dynamic at work. There is a spiritual dimension stirring up those feelings that they already have. It's not that these are innocent and kind, neutral people and the devil comes along and makes them bad or that God makes them bad. No, they are already against God. But the devil and his forces stir up those already existing feelings of enmity more and more. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is an invisible conflict behind all our visible struggles. Know your enemy. The enemy. And then, secondly, lastly, the strategy. The strategy. Why is it so vital to know your enemy? Because it will affect your strategy. It will dictate and direct how you fight. If you think that the real enemy is human beings, then the weapons that you fight with will be purely worldly. They will be human weapons and strategies. And that's exactly what we see the liberals doing, isn't it? We'll focus on political lobbying and debates and arguments and education and activism and mercy ministry. And there, don't get me wrong, there is a place for all of those things. But you remember what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. He says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. If we fail to see that our ultimate enemies are spiritual, then we are going to miss the main target. It reminds me of what Sherlock Holmes said about his arch enemy, Professor Moriarty. He says uh, about Moriarty, he is the Napoleon of crime, Watson. He is the organizer of half that is evil and nearly all that is undetected in this great city, London. He has a brain of the first order. He sits motionless like a spider in the center of its web. But that web has a thousand radiations and he knows well every quiver of each of them. He does little himself. 
He only plans, but his agents are numerous and splendidly organized. Is there a crime to be done? The word is passed to the professor. The matter is organized and carried out. The agent may be caught, but the central power which uses the agent is never caught, never so much as suspected. You see what Holmes is saying there. He's telling Watson the police strategy is all wrong because they don't understand who the real enemy is. They're spending all their time chasing after the agents, the minions, when they should have been focused on Moriarty. And the problem was that they didn't even know that Moriarty existed in the first place. And if we focus only on the enemies that we can see as Christians, our strategy will be all wrong because we don't realize who the real enemy is. So how do you fight against a spiritual enemy? And the answer to that question should be obvious to us all. We pray we pray. And again, we'll come back to that in the next message at four o'clock. But this gives us a right perspective, doesn't it, on world history and current affairs. It reminds us that we can't understand history simply by looking at the visible human players on the stage. We have to realize, we have to remember that there is a whole other dimension where the real fight is going on. The real struggle is not in Pretoria. The real struggle is not in Cape Town or Bloemfontein. The real struggle is not in the classroom or in the lecture theater or in the workplace or in the office or in the courts. The real struggle, the real war is taking place behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. This gives us a crucial perspective on evangelism. When a non-Christian hears the gospel, whether it's through the preaching of the word from a pulpit or through a friend telling them about the Lord Jesus over coffee, There is an invisible spiritual war that is raging all around them. Now remember, the non-Christian doesn't want to believe the gospel anyway. He's dead in his trespasses and his sins. He doesn't want to worship God. He doesn't want to love God. He doesn't want to obey God in everything. But that pre-existing disposition is being strengthened and hardened by unseen demonic forces. Remember, Jesus says in the parable of the sower, uh, the, the seed that falls in the path, the birds of the air come along, they swoop down and they gobble it up before it can even make any kind of impression on the ground. Uh, and Jesus explains that that is the devil, the evil one coming along and snatching away the word. That's the kind of thing that's happening when the gospel is being proclaimed. There's an invisible spiritual war going on. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. You see the problem? It's not that your non-Christian friend is too stupid to understand the gospel. It's not that there isn't enough evidence that God is real. There are demonic forces at play. There are demonic beings whispering into your friend's ear, covering her eyes with their hands and doing everything within their considerable power to stop them from seeing the truth. John says in 1 John 5, 19, in in a really chilling and horrible phrase, the whole world lies asleep in the arms of the evil one. Like a little baby, the whole world has just been nursed and rocked to sleep by the devil. 
and he's keeping them in ignorance. And I have to say to you, if you're not a Christian here today, that right now this is happening to you as the Word of God is being preached and explained to you in this room. A real spiritual battle is raging all around us here in this room. Demonic beings are doing their utmost to stop you listening, to stop you understanding, to stop you responding. They're on high alert here like nowhere else. Here especially they have been scrambled and they are on high alert for any sign that your conscience is being pricked, that you're being convicted of your sin, that you're starting to think about perhaps I need to become a Christian and give my life to Jesus Christ. And they are whispering their poison into your ears and they're wrapping their hands around your eyes to prevent you from seeing the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. And they have all kinds of different ways of doing that, don't they? Perhaps they encourage you to switch off as soon as the religious stuff starts. You come to Skogheim for uh, the, 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 the fun and the weather and the beach and the games and the, uh, well, we call it crack in Northern Ireland. I don't know if that's uh, a good word to use here or not. The, the fun, the banter, the enjoyment of being with friends, the good food. But you put up with the religious stuff. You tolerate the religious stuff because it's the other things that you're interested in. Perhaps they try to distract you whenever the talk's going on with other things that are going on in your life. Perhaps they get you to doze off to sleep. Perhaps they have a whole arsenal of arguments that they know work very well on you. They're tried and tested and they're using them again this week. You can't believe all this nonsense. Are you honestly telling me that an intelligent person would buy all this stuff? What would your friends say if you went back home and told them that you'd become a Christian? Just think how they would ridicule you. You're fine the way you are. There's nothing wrong with you. You're a really good person. God loves you just the way you are. Of course you'll go to heaven. You don't need to change. Becoming a Christian would make you miserable. Think of all the things that you'd have to give up. Don't do it. Don't put yourself through that. Of course you need to become a Christian. Absolutely you do. You really need to think about this. In fact, it's so important that you need to think a long time about this. You're not ready for this kind of decision. You you need to, to wait. And when you get home, then you can look into this a lot more carefully. Don't do anything rash. Don't rush into anything right now. These demonic Spirits have thousands, millions of lying reasons for you not to become a Christian. And they will feed you whatever line works best on you. And they know you. And they know how to get you. They've been studying you all your life. And they can tailor their arguments to your personality, to the unique bent of your character. And they know whether to appeal to your laziness or your pride or your love of popularity or your cowardice or your self-righteousness or whatever it might be. And I wonder if you're not a Christian this morning, what's the reason that they're whispering in your ear right now? Whatever reason you're hearing in your mind as to why you shouldn't give your life to Jesus Christ. That is the voice of the devil. And he wants to see you lost in hell along with him to all eternity. And I plead with you, and we all who are Christians here today plead with you and pray for you that you will stop listening to the voice of the devil and listen instead to the voice of the Lord 
calling you to repent and believe the gospel. There are spiritual forces at work, especially when the gospel is being preached. And that's especially true of non-Christians, but it's true for us who are Christians as well. We're not immune to the attacks of the devil. In fact, quite the opposite. We are the special targets of the evil one. And when we're tempted, the world and the flesh and the devil are all active. They're all involved. It's partly our own sinful nature. We want to sin all by ourselves. Even if there were no demonic interference, we would still sin because we have remaining sin in our hearts. We're not yet glorified. We're not yet made perfect in holiness. And we can't blame anyone else for our sin as if we are as pure as the driven snow and it was the devil who made us do it. We can't say that. But at the same time, we do need to take seriously what the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament emphasizes over and over again, that there is a spiritual enemy who is playing on our sinful desires that are already there in us, aggravating them and stirring them up. There are demonic spirits who put ideas into our heads and who urge us on and seduce us and lure us and tempt us with all kinds of twisted arguments. Um, I mentioned last night in the Q&A the book, uh, one of the books that was very helpful to me, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices by the Puritan Thomas Brooks. And this is exactly the kind of thing that he deals with. He takes the arguments that the devil uses and he gives you counter arguments, counterattacks to bring out of your arsenal. So the devil says, go ahead and do it. Give in to this temptation because afterwards you can repent. Jesus has died for all your sins. You can repent afterwards. And do you know what? You'll appreciate the grace of God all the more. And you'll love, doesn't Jesus say, he who has been forgiven much loves much? Well, the more you sin, the more you'll be forgiven, the more you'll love God. This is really a good thing for you spiritually to give in to sin. And it'll humble you. Nobody expects you to be perfect all the time. And you've been so good recently. You've done so well at resisting this sin. This is... This is, this is like a, just a reminder to you that you're not perfect. This is a very small thing. I mean, look at what he's doing. Look at the way she's, did you hear the way, did you hear what they said last night? This is nothing compared to that. People do this all the time and they think nothing of it. It's the kind of thing that the devil and his forces say to Christians, luring us into sin. And whenever God's word is being preached, especially, there is a war going on. Every Lord's Day, your church and mine becomes a battleground as the spiritual forces of good and evil clash. Why? Because the word of God is being opened and read and preached. And that is how saints are built up and sinners are converted. And so the preaching of the word of God, the public worship of God is a special focus of the devil's attack. One of his top priorities is to get Christians to stop listening to preaching, to stop you from coming to church, and to stop you from praying. Every faithful church of Christ is the front line in this war. That's why we find it so hard to concentrate on preaching. It's not just the inadequacies of the preacher, although there are plenty of those. There are spiritual forces focusing all their powers. Above all, this is their top priority. This is their number one mission goal, to stop you paying attention to the Word of God. 
That's why you find it so hard to read your Bible and to pray every day. That's why the prayer meetings in our churches and in our conferences are often the worst attended meetings out of everything. It's because the enemy's strategy is to stop you from doing anything that will make you spiritually stronger. It's interesting, isn't it, that prayer is so hard. Why should prayer be hard? Isn't prayer the easiest thing in the world, humanly speaking? You ever think about that? It's not as if you have to climb a mountain, get to the top of a very high mountain to to be able to pray. You don't have to go to a special holy place. You don't even have to speak out loud. You can pray silently in your heart. You don't even have to, it's a good thing, I think, to kneel down to pray or to stand to pray, but you don't even have to do that. You could be lying immobile, paralyzed, unable to speak on a hospital bed, and you could still pray. Humanly speaking, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. So why is it so hard? It's because of spiritual opposition. It's because of spiritual warfare. Now, all of this could discourage us and frighten us. It's an unsettling thought, isn't it, to think of what could be, if we could see into the invisible realm like Elisha's servant just for a moment, if we were given a glimpse, it could be a very unsettling and frightening thing to see what's going on all around us as we sit here. But we need to remember that it's not an equal fight The spiritual forces of evil are many, and they are powerful, but it is not an equal fight. Far from it. 1 John 4, verse 4, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you, the Holy Spirit, is greater than the one who is in the world. Or 2 Kings 6, 16, that Uh, story about Elisha and his servant uh, that I mentioned a moment ago, one of the most uh, dramatic and encouraging and wonderful stories in all of the Old Testament, and and that's saying something. You remember how Elisha and his servant are surrounded by this vast army of Syrians who have come to attack them and to take them off in captivity uh, or to kill them. So just Elisha and his servant, just two against hundreds and hundreds of armed soldiers outside the house surrounding them. And the servant is panicking. And Elisha prays that his servant's eyes would be opened to see into the spiritual realm. And God answers the prayer and his servant sees not just the Syrians with their little spears and swords, but he sees then All the angels of God, these awesome, fiery, flaming warriors with their chariots of fire, their swords of flaming fire, and suddenly the Syrians don't seem quite so frightening after all. And the angels of God descend on the army of the Syrians and strike them all down with blindness. Don't be afraid, Elisha answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And we see that here in Daniel 10. The Persian Empire was the greatest superpower on earth. It is a vast empire. Look it up on a map sometime uh, on the internet. And the prince of Persia, the demon in charge of this empire, is very, very powerful. But did you notice how Judah's angel, Michael, is described in verse 13? There is the prince of Persia, yes, but then there is Michael, and he is one of the chief princes. One of the most powerful spiritual beings is fighting for Judah. And what is Judah? compared to Persia. Judah is this tiny, tiny, insignificant little patch 
It was never big, but then since the exiles and the division of the kingdom, it's just got smaller and smaller and smaller. It's this tiny little dot surrounded by this vast empire and these great nations. Humanly speaking, Judah is nothing. It is politically insignificant. But it has a spiritual strength out of all proportion to its size. One of the chief princes, Michael, fights for Judah. Because in the spiritual realm, human might and power don't matter at all. And we see that here in Daniel himself. A bent, elderly old man kneeling in his room, praying. It looks pathetic, doesn't it, humanly speaking? You can imagine, you can imagine saying to all the forces of the Persian Empire, wait till you see our secret weapon. And you open Daniel's bedroom, and there's this old man on his knees, mumbling to himself, talking to nobody. There's our secret weapon. And you can just imagine all these soldiers and our generals and, and the, 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 the emperor himself, and you can just see them, oh, we're shaking, we're really scared. Well, you should be scared. Because look at the awesome effect that his prayers have in the world. The prayers that that one single elderly man prays bring the mighty eternal Son of God to fight against the powers of darkness in Persia. And brothers and sisters, that is the kind of thing that's happening when you kneel and pray beside your bed when you're having your quiet time in the mornings. That is what is happening as you gather your family every day for family worship. That's what has been happening as a few people gather for the prayer meeting here at Skogheim each morning at 7 o'clock. This is what happens when you gather together, just that few handfuls of you to pray in your church hall back at home. One praying Christian One small faithful church can do awesome things against a hostile, unbelieving community. In 1858, in the little tiny village of Kells in Northern Ireland, five or six men started a prayer meeting. They met to pray every week that God would send revival and turn the whole of the province, to himself. They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. They prayed earnestly. They prayed for many, many months. And what followed in 1859 was a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit that transformed Northern Ireland. And even still today, 170 years later, we're still benefiting from the effects of that revival, which came about because of the prayers, humanly speaking, of those five or six men. That's something that has happened in church history over and over again, and it can happen again. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that revival is God's normal way of preventing the world from sliding down into utter self-destruction. The world can't keep getting worse. Either Christ will return or he will send revival. And we need to be faithful in praying to the Lord to give us that revival. I hope you can begin to see, you already know it of course, but I hope you can begin to see in a fresh way from this chapter, why prayer is so crucial in the Christian life. We'll think about that more this afternoon. Our enemy, our ultimate enemy is spiritual. And so we need spiritual weapons to fight against him. And this is what happens when Christians pray. We're bringing the power of God 
the power of the holy angels into direct conflict with the powers of evil. Know your enemy so that you know how to fight your enemy. Amen. Close of the prayer, let's pray. Well, Lord our God, we do thank you so much for the word that has been preached to us this morning. We do pray that we would be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, and that you would stir us up to pray, that we would fight the good fight of faith. And so, Lord, we commit one another to you in prayer now, and even as we continue to have fellowship together, we pray that we might be mindful of your presence and keep our eyes firmly fixed upon Jesus Christ, our risen and exalted Lord and Savior, who has promised to build his church and that the gates of hell will not prevail. We give him all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.